The Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation formally awarded this year's the Truman Reagan Medal of Freedom to Puchung Ketsering from the International Campaign for Tibet for his lifelong dedication to promoting freedom and democracy in the face of communist tyranny in Tibet. The Truman Reagan Medal of Freedom is awarded to individuals who have demonstrated a lifelong commitment to freedom and democracy and opposition to communism and all other forms of tyranny since 1999. Pujung K. Tsiring, who is currently leading the research and monitoring unit for the International Campaign for Tibet, has earlier worked as the editor of Tibetan Bulletin, the official journal of Central Tibetan Administration, and served in the office of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Taramshala, as well as the, at the office of Tibet in Switzerland. Pujung La is joining us today for In Conversation with Tibet TV. Welcome to our program, Pujung La. Thank you very much. First of all, congratulations, Pujung La. Uh, I want to start by asking, uh, the prestigious Truman and Reagan Medal of Freedom has been awarded to a Tibetan for the first time. Uh, what uh, significance does that hold for you and how do you feel? Uh, thank you so much for the congratulations. And I believe that battle has uh, two significance. Uh, one in the general sense, if you look at the people who have received, people or organization, uh, organizations that have received uh, this uh, medal in the past. They are some of the giants in the international uh, political field, leading from prime ministers and presidents and even to the Pope in the Vatican. And so from that perspective, I'm a little bit overwhelmed that I, I, I'm put in that uh, position of being uh, along with them. Secondly, more importantly for the Tibetan issue, I believe I'm just a vehicle for this uh, medal uh, that... Uh, this uh, honor is actually meant for the Tibetan people and the non-violent circle of the Tibetan people that have been going on for the last six decades. And therefore, uh, the uh, organization saw it fit to uh, sort of honor the Tibetan movement uh, this year. And given the fact that we uh, here at the International Campaign for Tibet have some sort of connection with them and they know about us, uh, I believe that I was uh, selected to be the recipient of the medal. Okay, and uh, Pujungla, uh, you have been a member of the task force uh, set up by the Central Tibetan Administration to work on the issue related to the dialogue uh, process uh, with Chinese leadership. And uh, you were also the, uh, in the team led by the envoys of His Holiness Dalai Lama in the Sino-Tibet dialogue for many years. So uh, you have uh, experience of Tibet advocacy and activism uh, as well. So according to your experience, um, do you see uh, the need for Tibet advocacy uh, to redirect or reposition uh, for in the coming years? Um, if yes, in what ways? Yeah, before I answer that, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, the medal uh, awarding organization uh, talking about a lifetime achievement, uh, in one sense, if I have do have a lifetime achievement, then it is that from my beginning of work days, working with you all there at the uh, Department of International Information and International Relations, I've been always involved in the political aspect of uh, the Tibetan work, be it uh, in disseminating information about Tibet through uh, our media there, or being involved in meetings uh, in Dharamsala and elsewhere on uh, the political aspect of Tibet. So from that perspective, maybe there is some sort of a connection. And, and accordingly, even uh, uh, after coming to the International Campaign for Tibet in 1995, I was primarily sent to assist uh, then Special Envoy Kursu Lodi Gheri uh, uh, in his work again on uh, reaching out to the United States government and the international community. And when he was appointed the chief interlocutor uh, or from the Tibetan side to talk with the Chinese uh, side, I was naturally part of that team that was involved in the uh, discussions in the task force, as well as being part of the team that actually went to talk with the Chinese leadership. So from all these, what we can say uh, right now, and coming back to your question is that, uh, given the nature of the Tibetan struggle, if there is the need of a solution, that solution can only come about through a dialogue process with the Chinese leadership. And that is the uh, uh, reality, of, but also the thinking of the Tibetan leadership then, and I, I believe that it is still so for today. Uh, so since 2010 till now, there have not been any dialogue uh, with the Chinese leadership. 
Well, I believe our administration in the Ramsala, the Tibet movement as a whole, and even the Chinese government needs to review the situation to see whether the status quo, the, the non-existing dialogue process is good for either side. And my uh, conclusion is that it's not good for the Tibetans, nor is it good for the Chinese side. And there's the need for the, for the talk. As we speak, the U.S. Uh, State Secretary uh, Blinken is on a visit to China and they are trying to re-establish their sort of uh, uh, losing relationships uh, situation. And similarly, we I believe that I think on the Tibetan side too, there is the need for a dialogue process. Uh, we should be mindful of the fact that our dialogue process is very much dependent on uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama in more sense than one. Obviously, although His Holiness the Dalai Lama has devolved his political authority, he is a formidable force in the Tibet movement. He is the moral authority for the Tibetan people, and he is the binding force between Tibetans, whether in inside Tibet, outside, and uh, the Tibetan cause. Therefore, if we can achieve a dialogue process based on the current middle way approach and abide by it, only His Holiness the Dalai Lama can deliver it. That the Chinese government has to understand. They cannot hope waiting for this Dalai Lama to pass away and then hoping that the Tibetan issue will die away. Similarly, from our, the Tibetan side, we also need to review to see how we can take advantage of the time available for us now to do something about it. So, um, and uh, according to a historian Frank Decoder, the author of the well-known book, um, Mao's Great Famine, uh, Mao Zedong actually outnumbered um, both Hitler and Stalin uh, when it comes to crime against humanity. And by his uh, policy of great leap forward uh, in China, which uh, led up to deaths of up to like 45 million people, making it the biggest episode of mass murder uh, ever recorded. So, um, what do you think about these numbers uh, when you talk when we talk about communism, uh, and when you talk about the result of it in China, and how does Tibetans fit in this number uh, when we are talking about the period of 1950 to 1970s, according to you? Yeah, actually, uh, I, I'm not a scholar on uh, Chinese history or that, so I would not be able to specify whether this number is correct or not. But uh, the Victim for Communism Memorial Foundation did say uh, that uh, they, when they were set up in 1991, 92, there were around 100,000 uh, million, no, I'm sorry, 100 million people throughout the world who had suffered under communism. So possibly uh, the 45 million in China would uh, make sense. Uh, from that perspective, and I quoted the Tibetan number at uh, the event, uh, namely that from uh, the Central Tibetan Administration site, between 1949 and 1979, 1.2 million Tibetans have died under different circumstances uh, due to Chinese communist rule. And that uh, would indicate that if you look at from the Tibetan uh, population figure then of 6 million, it's one sixth. Uh, or more than that, of the Tibetan population uh, dying under an uh, unnecessary situation uh, created by the Chinese communists. Uh, you have been doing uh, research and monitoring work uh, closely over CCP's implementation of dark current policies over Tibetans in Tibet uh, for many years. What are the changes and shift in tactics of the CCP that you see now? Yes, it's not necessarily my person having seen it, but after having observed the situation a little bit, I can say that from the beginning of the Chinese communist rule in Tibet, initially they came with intent to virtually destroy Tibetan culture, Tibetan religion, Tibetan way of life, whether it's physical destruction of monasteries or making the monastic community go away or destroying the infrastructure and the system in place in Tibet. Then they realized in the uh, summer round in the mid 80s, uh, when there was a period of liberalization and when the Tibetan people's uh, rejuvenation of their spiritual heritage was uh, very much uh, uh, observable. Uh, then they realized that they cannot continue with this policy of physical destruction, physical, although much happened during the Cultural Revolution too, but they realized that in order to control the Tibetan people, they need to sort of use uh, Tibetan uh, belief in religion to their uh, 
advantage. And therefore, currently, we now see the Chinese authorities trying to control Tibetan religion. That uh, is done whether through the institution of reincarnation, which is a very spiritual process, but for the Chinese communists, it's a political tool for them, and they want to use it. Uh, as you will recall, in the initial period, in the late 1950s and the early 60s, they first banned the institution of reincarnation. Today, they not only allow it, but they want to control it. And because they believe that uh, through the reincarnation process, they can control the Tibetan people. And so that has happened in terms of uh, the religion and uh, way of life of the Tibetan people. But overall, the Chinese authorities now seem to be believing in the... Uh, uh, feeling that if they can convert Tibetan people into what could be called a Chinese person, whether in terms of our religion, our culture, uh, the uh, policy of Sinicization is basically trying to do away with the Tibetan identity. And they believe that once, if they're able to achieve that, then they'll be able to rule over the Tibetan people. And therefore, uh, I think this we need to understand even uh, the reason why they banned the photos of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Tibet today, it's not because that the photos mean anything to them, but they realize the power behind His Holiness the Dalai Lama. They know that His Holiness is the binding force for the Tibetan people. And if they can take His Holiness away from the minds of the Tibetan people, from the memory of the Tibetan people now and the future generation, the coming young uh, Tibetan, then they would have uh, won over. So that seems to be their policy. As the first Tibetan to be uh, awarded uh, this Medal of Freedom, representing all other people who were or who are uh, victims of communism, how do you relate to their struggle and uh, their plight? What message do you want to send out? Actually, the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation holds an uh, annual event every day at the same time. And we at the International Campaign for Tibet, as well as the Office of Tibet, have been attending it every year when they uh, remember those people who have died under communism. There's a flower offering, there's a wreath laying, it's called the roll call. And uh, in the roll call, you'll find uh, people who have either suffered under communism, whether it's Chinese, Uyghurs, Tibetans, or Vietnamese, uh, others, or countries that have once been communist but now are democrats, like the, many of the Eastern European countries, the Czech Republic or uh, uh, Poland or Lithuania. And so they come and uh, the diplomats from these countries and representatives from different communities come to those any event. And on the day of the medal uh, uh, event, uh, many of them came to me saying how much they share our sort of uh, experience in terms of uh, communist misrule. And therefore, this was something that uh, I think maybe the Victims for Communism Memorial uh, Foundation intended to do to sort of uh, sensitize other communist uh, community or people who have suffered under communism that the Tibetan people do continue to suffer under communism. Pujungla, thank you so much for your time and sharing your thoughts today. And congratulations once again. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Bindula. With this, we have come to the end of today's In Conversation with Tibet TV. See you in the next episode. <laughs>